Hello everyone, this is going to be chapter 13, part 2, A House Divided, and what the heck, we'll start with the quote itself from Abraham Lincoln, who said during uh, his uh, run for, Cong uh, for the Senate in 1858, A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. So let's look at how it got that way. Let's get to the Civil War. So let's start with this idea of the, the, the Mexican-American War poisoning our country. Uh, after the seizure of this Mexican land, a lot of people looking at it said that basically uh, this new territory would be an enormous risk to the uh unhealthy balance that we had going on between slave and free states, that this could rock that boat. Ralph Waldo Emerson called it a dose of arsenic, calling it poison that would kill us from the inside. And soon it did poison us. It didn't kill us, but it poisoned us. Uh, American life, political parties, even religions like Baptists uh, and Methodists divided between Northern and Southern. And so we see that this uh, divided us along regional lines. And we see it uh, first in 1846 with the Wilmot Proviso. So uh, the Missouri Compromise was still in place in 1846. However, it was about to be tested in a big way by uh, the New Mexican Territory and by a congressman named David Wilmot from Pennsylvania who uh, proposed a law saying that slavery should not be in any of the territory we get from Mexico, and this is called the Wilmot Proviso, and it started a very big debate over the expansion of slavery, um, and while it passed the House, it never passed the Senate, so this never actually became a law. However, it opened up the question again, so here we are. Uh, in 1848, the presidential elections, we see a new party pop up, the Free Soil Party, that had the same idea that this Mexican territory should be uh, have no slaves within it. Um, and they were uh, nominating the former president, Martin Van Buren, to be their candidate. Um, that should be Buren, by the way. Uh, this new party was opposed to the expansion of slavery and actually got 300,000 votes, which ain't bad, especially for a new party. Uh, the Democratic platform, on the other hand, said that states uh, themselves should get to choose, and we're going to talk about this later. This is the uh, term known as popular sovereignty. The Whigs didn't really say anything on the issue. They uh, went with the old Andrew Jackson standby, which is elect a war hero. And that's what they did. They elected uh, Zachary Taylor, uh, one of the heroes of the Mexican War. Um, and uh, they got the White House basically by avoiding the slavery issue. So here's our 12th president, Zachary Taylor from Virginia, although he lived all over the country. Uh, he was a general. He was a traveling general in the U.S. Army, known as the hero of Buena Vista from the Mexican War. Um, and he died in office, as we can see by those dates up there, uh, after um, uh, putting in the, the, the stone, sort of the, the keystone of, of the Washington Monument. Uh, on July 4th uh, of 1850, he went back to the White House, ate a bunch of cherries, drank a bunch of milk, uh, and pretty quickly got stomach cramps, died of cholera, people think, uh, a few days later. Uh, some people thought, was he murdered? He was not. So, the Free Soilers were very popular in the North. Um, they were uh, believers in the precedent that the Northwest Territory forbade slavery, the Missouri Compromise forbade slavery north of that line, uh, and therefore we should continue to forbid slavery in the West. Um, the popularity of the Free Soil Campaign was tied not to the idea of abolition. These guys were not hardcore, you know, abolitionists. They, they were not, uh, you know, uh, they were not Frederick Douglass. Um, they were more tied to the idea that the West should be open to white settlers and white landowners so that white people could get money and not have to compete against enslaved labor in the West. Southerners, on the other hand, believe that in order for slavery to survive, it had to go West. And so uh, both were sort of campaigning for the rights of white people, just different white people mainly. So here is a banner for the Free Soil Party, here we see. And we also see Charles Sumner on that, uh, keep an ear out for that name. Now, in 1848, this was a very turbulent year across the world, not just across our country. 
um, there were several revolutions that took place across Europe that were mainly put down. Uh, there was a uh, Chartist uh, uh, revolution in England. The French overthrew their monarch. Uh, they were hungry, tried to break from Austria, and people were worried that this might be catching and this might come to America. And the crisis came to a head in 1850 in America when California applied to become a state and a free state, throwing off that ever crucial balance between northern and southern states. Now, so who do we call in to compromise? We call in Henry Clay, known as the Great Compromiser, and here he is compromising again. Uh, he put forward another compromise, cobbled together from things that he thought would keep everybody happy. Um, and it had several parts. First of all, he said California would enter as a free state. Second of all, the, uh, he would outlaw the slave trade in Washington, D.C., although slavery would still be allowed. Uh, the trading of slaves would be disallowed. Uh, a new fugitive slave law would require northern states to help recapture any runaway enslaved people who made it to the north. Um, and also the free slave status of the rest of the Mexican territory would be chosen by the people of those states, not by the country. Now, this was the last great debate for that last generation of like, you know, 1812 to 1850 uh, great leaders of our country. Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, both very old men, were calling for the passage of the Compromise with the help of a guy named Stephen Douglas, who we're going to see a lot of in a minute. Uh, meanwhile, John C. Calhoun, uh, who was too sick to even speak, uh, had a friend read out a speech against it. All three of these guys, these great giants of of the of the Senate and the House, uh, Webster, Clay, and Calhoun, would all be dead within the next year to two years. Meanwhile, guys like Stephen Douglas and William Seward of New York were uh, sort of come these up and coming young senators and congressmen, sort of uh, becoming the uh, the leaders, the new leaders in uh, the legislative branch. Uh, Seward, by the way, was opposed to slavery, saying that there was a higher law, aka God, who thought that slavery was sinful. This would come back to haunt him. By the way, here are the cenotaphs, the empty graves of Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun right next to each other. Even though they disagreed with each other so much, uh, their cenotaphs are right next to each other in the Congressional Cemetery, even though their bodies have gone to different graveyards. And here, by the way, is William Seward. He's going to be important in the next chapter, 1801 to 1872 from New York. He had been the governor of New York and a senator from New York, and he's going to be secretary of state under Abraham Lincoln. Very important guy. Uh, he was nearly assassinated, by the way, the same night as Lincoln. Uh, he was attacked with a knife, and it was only the fact that he was wearing a neck brace that saved him. Uh, he also later bought Alaska from Russia in 1868, called Seward's Icebox sometimes. So this compromise, the Compromise of 1850, eventually passed. Uh, Taylor was actually uh, against it because he just wanted the South to sign it. He didn't like the idea that they were holding it hostage. Uh, however, he died before he could force them to. And the new president, Millard Fillmore, who we're going to spend about two seconds on, favored the compromise as a way to keep the peace uh, and keep that, if, if not a balance, at least uh, some sort of decorum. So here's our 13th president, Millard Fillmore, 1850-53, to 53, from New York, where he was a congressman and former vice president of the United States, uh, oftentimes rated as one of our worst presidents. He, one, one historian said that to discuss Millard Fillmore is to overrate him. Ouch. Uh, he also switched parties several times. He was a Whig, a know-nothing, a Democrat, and an anti-Masonic, which was a really niche uh, uh, party back in the 1830s. We're going to talk about the know-nothings in a minute. Now, the most uh, divisive, contentious part of this compromise was probably the Fugitive Slave Act, which uh, basically said that um, uh, federal commissioners would determine if black people charged as runaway slaves were guilty. They would not get a jury trial, and uh, the, the Fugitive Slave Act would force Northerners to uh, help return them to slavery, and local northern authorities were not able to stop them. In fact, they had to help them. Uh, this new law helped to strengthen the power of the Underground Railroad, who really kicked into high gear at this point, along with the help of actual railroads that could get people across the country very, very quickly. Uh, they were now focused on getting runaways up into Canada. Uh, and it also caused several large riots where uh, people in the north 
uh, tried to save runaway slaves, maybe not necessarily because they were abolitionists, but at least because they did not like being told what to do by the South, including the people of Christiana, Pennsylvania, who rose up and straight up killed a Southern slave owner who came into town looking for a runaway. Uh, they killed him and sent the guy north. Uh, so one guy said, we went to bed one night, old fashioned, conservative, compromised union Whigs, and waked up stark mad abolitionists. We start to see that the, the division uh, between North and South and slave and free is becoming much more prevalent during this time period. So this compromise of 1850 seemed to hold the country together, at least temporarily. Uh, in 1852, Franklin Pierce won the White House on a platform that actually recognized the compromise as sort of the best thing for our country. However, the country was falling further and further into north-south sectionalism. In 1854, Stephen Douglas of Illinois, who we met briefly uh, a little bit back there, uh, proposed a bill that would allow the people of Kansas and Nebraska to decide for themselves whether or not they wanted to be slave states or free states. And this is the idea of popular sovereignty. Uh, Congress doesn't get to choose whether or not they're slave states or free states. Instead, the people of these states get to choose. And that's the way that we're going to solve the slavery question from here on in, he said. So here is Stephen Douglas, 1813 to 1861. Uh, he was born in Vermont, but lived a good chunk of his life in Illinois, where he was a congressman and a senator. And he was a competitor for Ab with Abraham Lincoln for many things, as we're going to see. Uh, he also briefly dated Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, although he lost that competition. And also, here's our 14th president, another flyby president, uh, Franklin Pierce, 1853-57, to 57, from New Hampshire, where he was a congressman and a senator, and unfortunately known to be a bit of an elbow bender. Uh, he uh, had fainted in the saddle more than once during the Mexican War, and was said to be, instead of the winner of many a hard-fought battle, the winner of many a hard-fought bottle instead. So, this Kansas-Nebraska Act was technically against the Missouri Compromise, uh, because both Kansas and Nebraska were above the free line. Uh, but Douglas said, you know what? Forget the Missouri Compromise. Let's get past that. Uh, it's not going to work anymore. Uh, and uh, this Kansas-Nebraska Act passed. However, it did have several unintended consequences, the first of which was that uh, the Democratic Party suddenly split between North and South. Um, some Northern Democrats who saw the kind of the writing on the wall basically said, I cannot stay with this old party of mine anymore. And so they fled to a new party that was coming in called the, the Republican Party. Uh, they fled with many uh, anti, uh, anti-slavery anti Whigs who were going in too. So let's look at the rise of the Republicans. So why did they become uh, the big party? Well, first of all, the Whig party was dying. They needed another party. But one of the first reasons was the economy. The, the Republicans uh, were pro-sort of industrialism. And at the end of the Industrial Revolution, um, we saw America split sort of between North and South. And the Republicans, in general, supported free labor, the idea that, um, you know, people should be able to work where they wanted and work, uh, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, change jobs if you want to, uh, work in a free market economy, um, increase the amount of industry, increase the amount of railroads in the North and the West. Uh, and a lot of this was tied to the idea that we should decrease the amount of slavery because slavery in, uh, decreased the ability to um, get the jobs that white people wanted. Republicans latched onto the idea of also of internal improvements, focusing on the building of railroads during this time, which you can see here. Uh, railroads, I mean, it looks like veins in a heart. So we can see that railroads are really the beating heart of our country, and it's beating a lot more up in the north than in the south. Republicans are also bolstered by uh, a short-lived third party called the American Party that came and went. Uh, this party was an anti-immigrant party. That was their main thing. Anti-immigrant, but also anti-slavery, anti-Catholic, anti-drinking. Uh, but they supported the idea that only American-born citizens should hold public office and be allowed to vote. Uh, they were generally called the Know Nothing Party uh, because they started out as a secret society. And if anyone said, hey, what happened to that meeting last night of the American Party? They would say, I know nothing of the American Party, uh, which is great. <laughs> what a great nickname, the Know Nothing Party. Uh, 
So here's a know-nothing flag. Uh, and the know-nothings, God, I really love calling them that, were a very popular uh, party for a hot minute in the 1850s. Uh, they won several large cities uh, in the 1850s, like New York, San Francisco, Boston. Um, they were, however, against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, and eventually, when their party sort of disintegrated, they went to the Republican Party. And so the importance of, of they eventually died because the importance of uh, immigrants coming in, they, these new immigrants were joining political parties and so had a lot of power. Uh, and they were also important to labor in the North. So by 1856, the Republican Party was the big opponent to the Democrats. And uh, they were against uh, slavery in the West. They were warning that this... Uh, pro-Southern, pro-slavery contingency of politicians was the more dangerous enemy than immigrants or foreigners or anything else. This slave power was the most important thing. They also characterized the North and the ability of Northerners to sort of uh, progress and to choose their jobs and to have free labor. Uh, this is what characterized the North as free. Uh, a man could choose whatever he wanted to do and succeed on his own. The South, they said, was, was, a, was a stagnant pond. Slaves did all the work. The planter, the, the, the higher-ups, you know, held all the power. Um, the ability to make progress in that area was impossible. And this is not necessarily, again, a question of abolition. Many of the Republicans were as racially intolerant as any in the Democratic Party. Many Northerners had issues with uh, African Americans just as much as Southerners. However, they viewed slavery as against this whole free labor system that they were trying to create. Uh, and William Seward basically said that uh, having both a slave and a free society in America is incompatible. One has to be true, one has to be uh, untrue. And uh, Abraham Lincoln picked up on this too with that uh, House Divided speech that he talked about. We have to choose one. So other events in the 1850s helped to spread the popularity of the Republican Party, and that is uh, this growing divisiveness over slavery. Uh, so we see the Kansas-Nebraska Act in effect when Kansas held elections in 1854 and 55 to choose whether they were going to be slave or free. In response to this, hundreds of pro-slavery men from Missouri illegally traveled into Kansas to vote uh, and try to basically push Kansas uh, into the slavery side. Uh, in the end, we had a free government and a slave government uh, form in Kansas, which uh, led to a lot of violence between these two sides. And the international and national newspapers called this bleeding Kansas because uh, it was almost like a little, little mini civil war that started in about 1854 and lasted throughout the civil war. So here is the sacking of Lawrence, where a bunch of pro-slavery men burned down the anti-slavery city of Lawrence, Kansas, which is where the university is these days. Now, in response to all this violence, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts gave a speech called The Crime Against Kansas in the Senate, where he said, you, the South, are uh, to blame for this violence. This is your fault. And then he actually pointed at one specific senator from South Carolina and said, you, sir, you are at fault for this. Uh, the next day, the senator's son-in-law, a congressman by the name of Preston Brooks, walked up behind Charles Sumner and started beating him nearly to death with his cane. And this is happening on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Uh, one of a few times where we see uh, violence break out between the North and the South. Uh, Sumner ended up with permanent brain damage, but stayed in the Senate and became very important, uh, especially during the war and during Reconstruction. Uh, meanwhile, Brook, Brooks, Preston Brooks, got several new canes from Southern and Myers uh, labeled with hit him again. So we can see that things are getting a little tense in the Senate. So here we see uh, Preston Brooks attacking Charles Sumner uh, with his cane. And here's where it actually happened, uh, the photo by Ami. So, in 1856, the Republicans ran their first presidential candidate, a guy named John C. Fremont, who had been called the Pathfinder. He had been part of the Mexican War. He had been important in California politics. And the main part of their platform was they expressed their resistance to the spread of slavery. 
The Democrats ran a guy named James Buchanan who had been out of the country and therefore wasn't uh, touched by the slavery question. Um, they were putting their platform as a popular sovereignty. The Republicans did very well for a first-timer party. Uh, however, in the end, James Buchanan won. Uh, however, if you look at the election map of 1856, you can see it is split north and south. So here's John C. Fremont. I put him on here partially because he's a St. Louisan, uh, eventually. 1813 to 1890, born in Georgia, but he lived everywhere. He was a soldier, an explorer, and eventually a senator from California. Uh, he helped free California from Mexican control. Uh, and during the Civil War, he was uh, the head of the Union Army in the West and stationed in St. Louis, which is why we have a Fremont Avenue in St. Louis. And he married into the very powerful uh, Benton family of St. Louis, uh, which Benton Park is named after. And here is our 15th president, James Buchanan, 1857 to 61, from Pennsylvania, where he had been a congressman and a senator. He was also a secretary of state and minister to Great Britain. He's also, so far, our only unmarried president. Some presidents have gotten married later or were widowed or something like that. He is, so far, our only president who had never gotten married. And so here also is the uh, map, and you can see it's a very divided now, let's look at Lincoln. Uh, Buchanan saw his job as keeping the peace. Our country is, is splitting at the seams. We need to keep the peace between the two sides. Um, however, this is proving to be very difficult due to a bunch of other events that we're seeing in the run-up to 1860. Um, one of these events is uh, the Supreme Court case of Dred Scott v. Sanford. So, Dred Scott was an enslaved man from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, he had been taken by his owner to Illinois and then all the way up to Wisconsin. Um, and when he got back to the Missouri, he sued, saying that uh, he was a free man the moment he set foot on free soil. Uh, and in the end, this went all the way up to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court ruled against Scott six to three. However, all nine of the judges wanted to make clear what their point of view was in this. But it was the um, decision of Chief Justice Roger Taney writing for the majority that had the biggest impact, and this is going to be really important. So, by the way, here's uh, Dredd and Harriet Scott, their statue uh, at the old courthouse in St. Louis. Roger Taney said whew, that not only was Dred Scott still an enslaved person, not only was he not free, he was not a citizen. In fact, nobody who was African American was a citizen, slave or free. The Constitution, he said, was not written with the idea that slave or, that slaves would ever be citizens or that, that African Americans would ever be citizens of these United States. That was a big step right there. And then he took a bigger step forward after that. He said that he basically decided, I'm going to end this question of, you know, uh, where is slavery legal? I'm going to end it once and for all here. And he said, the Kansas-Nebraska Act has already said the Missouri Compromise is invalid. However, I'm going to say that the, the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. You can have an enslaved person in Florida, in Missouri, in Massachusetts, on Mars if you want to. Anywhere that they're uh, in the United States, slavery is legal. Wow. That is a huge decision right there. Um, he went way beyond what he was asked to do and made a huge decision right there. So this is Dred Scott, 1799 to 1858. Uh, he was born in Virginia but moved throughout the country, including to St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where he was an enslaved person and a hotel porter after he was freed. Uh, and he was freed after his family lost the case. Some abolitionists basically paid for his freedom. However, he died only about a year later of tuberculosis, unfortunately, uh, and was buried in Calvary Cemetery in St. Louis. You can still go and visit his grave today. And here's Roger Taney, and part of his uh, decision said, What Dred Scott's master might lawfully do with Dred Scott in the free state of Illinois, every other master may lawfully do with any other one or one thousand slaves in Illinois or any other free state. Wow. This is a big decision, guys. So, this caused uh, some controversy. Uh, it is considered the most divisive by many, and by many the worst decision ever handed down by the Supreme Court full stop. 
Northern abolitionists tore into Tani for this decision, uh, going back as far as ancient Rome to prove him wrong. Southerners, however, loved this decision, believing that the, the whole slavery question had been resolved and that uh, slavery could happen literally anywhere. Buchanan basically said that uh, he sided with the decision. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has made their decision. Um, however, Stephen Douglas actually is still working to try to keep popular sovereignty a thing, and he said that Kansas could not join the Union as a slave state. In fact, it didn't join until 1860 when it joined as a free state. Now, in 1858, Douglas is running for re-election to the Senate, and he faces a new competitor, uh, and this becomes sort of a microcosm for the, the larger debates raging across the country. He's facing Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln's an interesting case at this point. He's a former Whig. Uh, he had been a state congressman several times. Uh, he had been a congressman in the House of Representatives in D.C. for two years, one term. Uh, he was small-time compared to Douglas. However, he was an up-and-coming, very popular, uh, very... Um, well-respected lawyer uh, across the country. Uh, and he also was not an abolitionist, at least not at this point. He said that he detested slavery. However, he was not calling for immediate abolition of all slavery. Instead, he was calling for the restriction of it. He said it should not move west. Um, and so he is. Uh, that's where he is at this moment. We'll see that he changes over time. So Lincoln and Douglas held a series of debates across Illinois, each of them, I think, nine debates lasting hours. They just went after each other for hours. And in these Lincoln-Douglas debates, Lincoln made the point very clear, much like um, William Seward had. There is no middle ground. You have to be either for or against slavery, and this house divided shall not stand. And he said, and I am against it. Um, you cannot stand in the middle. You cannot try to make... No more compromises, basically. Uh, now, Douglas won re-election. However, the debates made Lincoln a national figure, um, and a lot of people started whispering his name uh, when it came to the presidency in 1860. So here's a political cartoon of uh, Lincoln and Douglas fighting each other. This is for the 1860 White House, though. Now, uh, lastly, before we get to the 1860 presidential election, there was... Uh, an outbreak of violence during this time, too. We'd already seen, uh, although we haven't talked about it, uh, a white preacher named Elijah P. Lovejoy being shot and killed in Alton, Illinois, uh, for printing a pro an anti-slavery um, newspaper. Um, and this really shocked people, but what shocked them more was in 1859, when uh, there was an armed attack in Harper's Ferry, uh, Virginia, which is now West Virginia, um, and it was perpetrated by a guy named John Brown, who was fanatically anti-slavery. He believed that he had been chosen by God to end slavery. And he hoped, his plan was, go into Harper's Ferry, steal a bunch of weapons, go down south, free the slaves, and lead an army of freed slaves to destroy slavery within the south. This was his plan. It never got out of Harper's Ferry. It was a fool's errand the entire time. Most of his men were, were killed. Uh, by U.S. Army soldiers led by former, uh, or, or soon-to-be, I'm sorry, uh, Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Brown himself was shot, uh, grievously wounded, captured, put on trial, uh, and eventually hanged for treason by the state of Virginia. So here's John Brown, 1850 to 18, 1800 to 1859, uh, born in Connecticut, but he moved everywhere because he was a failed businessman. He tried uh, business in a bunch of different states and kept not quite making it. Uh, in the end, he found that anti-slavery was his true calling. Uh, he ended up uh, taking part in Bleeding Kansas, where he killed five pro-slavery men uh, by hacking them to death with broadswords in Pottawatomie Creek, Kansas. This was his uh, revenge killing for the sacking of Lawrence. Brown's death, however, made him a martyr to the abolitionists. Many, like Thoreau and Emerson, said he was Christ-like, going, going to the gallows like Christ. Um, of course, uh, the, the South saw him in a very different light. Um, along with this, one of the most interesting importances of him is the song, John Brown's Body, uh, where his body is moldering in the grave, but his soul is marching on, 
Glory, Hallelujah. Uh, this is a very famous song from the time period. And here is John Brown uh, kissing a, uh, a young uh, African-American baby. Uh, this is an, a, a story that many people hear on his way to the, the gallows. He stopped and either kissed or blessed a young African-American child. Now, all these events are starting to lead many in the South to feel that they might need to go. Um, the money seemed to be going north. Uh, the South seemed to be disregarded or vilified by many. Uh, and they started talking about maybe we should expand slavery into Cuba or into Mexico or into Nicaragua, where a guy actually went down there trying to set up an independent country in Nicaragua. Uh, many others were calling for secession, leaving the country outright. And at the Democratic Convention in 1860, Stephen Douglas was put forward as the uh, Democratic nominee for president. Uh, this is going to be ground zero for the secession crisis. The Democrats, however, split over northern and southern uh, leaders. Uh, the southern states walked out, basically uh, holding their own convention, and now we have two Democrats running for president. We have Stephen Douglas and we have John Brecken Breckenridge of Kentucky uh, representing the southern states. And so the northerners were calling for the popular sovereignty standpoint of, of Douglas. Southerners said, we want to guarantee the rights of slave owners in this country. Meanwhile, in Chicago, the Republicans met, uh, and it looked like we were going to have several people in the running, like William Seward of New York, or maybe Sam and Chase of Ohio, or Ed Bates from St. Louis. In the end, however, their candidate was a compromise candidate, a dark horse, kind of. He was nobody's first choice, or at least not many. However, he was a lot of people's second choice for the presidency, uh, and he appealed to the moderates in this situation, so uh, he is a great compromise choice, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and so uh, he called for the uh, stopping of slavery where it was, not to, not to full-on stop it, but to stop its spread, at least. In the end, four people ran for president, Lincoln, Douglas Breckinridge, and John Bell of Tennessee, who was from a hastily put-together constitutional union party. Uh, their thing was, we need to keep the union together at all costs, no matter what. Stop poking the slavery issue. Now, with four nominees and a whole lot of sectional differences, uh, it was clear there would be no one majority. There was nobody who would get over 50%. However, in the end, Abraham Lincoln won the most popular votes and the most electoral votes, making him the clear winner. And this is without him even appearing on the ballot in 10 southern states. So here are the four guys who ran for president and what they were standing for. You can read that on your own. Uh, here is the, uh, the map, and as you can see, again, very divided. And here is our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, 1861 to 1865. He is from Kentucky, moved to Indiana, and eventually settled in Illinois, where he was a state congressman and then a, uh, uh, a representative uh, in the House of Representatives from Illinois. He is also our tallest president and our first, but not our last, unfortunately, president to die by assassination. Now, let's look at the buildup to the Civil War, and this is the end right here. So, after the election, both groups were trying to figure out a way to hold the country together. Uh, a guy named John uh, Crittenden of Kentucky proposed the Crittenden Compromise that said, let's move that Missouri Compromise line all the way to the Pacific Ocean uh, and sort of enshrine slavery in the Constitution. But it was not enough. The, the die had been cast. It was too little, too late. Lincoln also refused to compromise on slavery. He said, no, we are going to stand firm on this issue from here on in. No more compromise. Before Lincoln even took office, seven states had left the United States. Uh, they created their own constitution, which looked very similar to the U.S. Constitution with a few small changes, the most glaring one being that there was an absolute right to slavery in the Southern Constitution. Um, Alexander, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his last name right now, but the vice president, Stevens, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of uh, the Confederacy said that this new country is based upon the fact that the black man is not equal to the white man. Uh, and this was the new Confederate States of America. And here we go. Uh, everything in dark red down south, those are the original states to leave. Everybody in yellow are the states that uh, left 
after Fort Sumter. Uh, everything in uh, pink are the border states that did not leave, and everything in green are the uh, Union states. So even after these seven states left, Lincoln still thought he could keep it together. Uh, technically, he said you can't leave the United States. The Constitution says you can enter, but you can't leave. Um, and he said uh, in his inaugural that uh, if the Civil War started, it's not going to be on me. It's going to be on you guys down south. Uh, and for the first month of his presidency, he tiptoed as lightly as he could, basically trying to hold strong, but also trying not to further anger the, uh, the, the southern states. Until April 12th, 1861, where Lincoln sent a ship to resupply the uh, a, a uh, important uh, holdout uh, fort in Charleston Harbor in South Carolina. Uh, it was still uh, run by Union troops. Um, and he said, I'm only going down there to resupply them with food, not with weapons. However, the South didn't believe him, took this as an act of aggression, and uh, they bombarded Fort Sumter for two days. April 12th to 18, April uh, 14th, they surrendered on the 14th. And the Battle of Fort Sumter started the Civil War. It was a relatively short and bloodless campaign, whoop, uh, and it would lead to the, uh, however, it would lead to a very bloody war later on. Um, the day after this, Lincoln called for volunteers to help put down the insurrection, and this is the beginning of the Civil War right here. And here is Fort Sumter in South Carolina as it stands today.